COVID-19 has held a flame to the critical role human rights play in protecting vulnerable and marginalised populations, as well as the catastrophic consequences now and in the future. Older persons have faced high infection and mortality rates, while at the same time are often subjected to ageism in public discourse, discrimination in healthcare and triage decisions, neglect and abuse, isolation without access to essential services, and a greater exposure and poor treatment in care institutions. The UN Secretary General this morning, in his uh, um, releasing a very important report, said that the fatality rate for older people overall is much higher than the average. And for those over 80 years of age, it's five times more likely. While action has been taken on some fronts, it is not yet the global force by any means. And there are considerable need for the international community to learn from shortcomings now in respect to the human rights of older people. For this reason and many others, we are just delighted to have Peggy Hicks with us this morning from the UN Human Rights Office to provide opening remarks. But at the same time, I also want to acknowledge two other colleagues, Rio Hada, Team Leader, Economic and Social Issues Section, the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, and Amal Abu Rafay, Chief Program Officer or Chief of the Program on Aging, UN DESA. So let me tell you a little bit about Peggy Hicks. Since January 2016, she has served as Director of the Thematic Engagement, Special Procedures and Right to Development Division at the UN's Human Rights Office. But Peggy has a long career and experience in human rights. She was the Global Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch, responsible for coordinating Human Rights Watch's advocacy team, it's early in the morning, advocacy team, and providing direction to its advocacy worldwide. Director of the Office of Returns and Communities in the UN Mission in Kosovo, and as Deputy High Representative for Human Rights in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And also Director of Programs for the International Human Rights Law Group, now Global Rights. Clinical Professor of Human Rights and Refugee Law, and an expert consultant. You know, all of these words say to me that Peggy has not only experience and expertise, you know, she has her heart in this whole field and she really works at a grassroots level as well as within the UN system. So thank you so much for being with us this morning, Peggy. I hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Jane, for that incredibly kind introduction. I'm, I'm so uh, fortunate to be able to be with you today and to the International Federation of Aging for pulling us all together on this important topic. It's an it's a incredibly valuable opportunity and, and we really appreciate you and your team and, and as you said, those in, in uh, the other UN family that are, that are here with us, uh, Rio and Amal, to, to support us in this effort. You've already highlighted what we all know and what I believe those on the call will have experienced and seen. Uh, this is a pandemic that is having an extraordinarily hard impact on older persons. Uh, they are at, uh, older per persons are at particularly high risk. Uh, yet the response to the pandemic we've seen hasn't always taken that into account in the variety of ways that it should. And you know, has laid bare at the same time some of the underlying gaps that older persons face in terms of the types of human rights protection that should exist for everybody. And that includes issues like lack of social protection, access to health services, participation in decision making, and of course, freedom from violence, neglect, and abuse. As you've referenced, Jane, and we're very glad to say, the UN Secretary General has issued a policy brief on this issue just today. And there's a video statement and the report itself are now available and we'll circulate the links on that. And of course, the idea behind that was that the Secretary General wanted to highlight these issues in the uh, desire to get more action to be taken across the spectrum by governments and civil society and all stakeholders to really look at 
the impact of this crisis on older persons and to address it better. Uh, we're, the report clearly talks about the issues, but it also talks about the, puts a spotlight on the ways in which older persons are contributing directly to the response to COVID-19 as well, and the roles that they play in their families and communities in helping to address this crisis. And it also calls for a shift away from a paternalistic or ageist approach to these issues that really recognizes the need for older persons to be part of and at the center of our decision-making processes. Uh, and most importantly, I'd say at the end, it highlights that the, some of the problems that we're facing in this pandemic really do illustrate some of the, the gaps that we've been talking about for some time and the need for us to really focus on those and figure out how we address those underlying structural issues when we build back from this crisis. So in looking at uh, these issues and the report itself, I wanted to, to walk through sort of three general areas and then make three sort of key concluding points uh, that we think are important. First of all, the report really looks at the immediate health impacts from the pandemic. And you know there are sort of uh, three different situations there number of threes today um, that I think are important for us to look at. The first is issues that older persons are facing with access to care. Every life has equal value and older persons cannot be left behind as collaterals in this pandemic. We need to ensure that difficult healthcare decisions affecting older persons are guided by a commitment to dignity and the right to health. Um, what we've seen uh, is that there is a need to do a number of things. First of all, we would like to see a stepped up effort to identify and treat older people at risk, particularly since one, one out of every five people over 70 has an underlying health condition that makes them more at risk from COVID-19. We need to factor that into the national response plans more directly. We also want to make sure that there is access to health services that are not related to COVID-19 during this period. We need to protect that, including access to rehabilitation and to palliative care. But one of the critical issues that's come up, and I expect is on the minds of some of you, is that we also need to make sure that critical life and death decisions that are being made under tremendous pressure and limited resources during this pandemic really respect the rights of older persons. We want to ensure that there aren't generalized assumptions about life expectancy or chances of survival based on age or other conditions. Um, and instead, and the report focuses on this, we need to make sure that medical pro protocols require that medical decisions are based on medical need, ethical criteria, and the best available scientific evidence, not based on age, pre-existing impairments, high support needs, quality of life assessments, disability, or medical bias. We also want to bring in the need for consent to medical treatment and to ensure that there isn't undue pressure on older persons regarding treatment or refusal of treatment in advance of receiving it. So that's one big area, the access to care. Second, the report highlights, and I wanted to spotlight today as well, a particular concern around the situation of older persons in residential care facilities. Some really horrifying statistics have emerged about this and, and uh, deaths in uh, residential long-term care facilities, for example, in Europe, are about half of the overall death total. So this is not something that can afford to be overlooked. So two specific recommendations in that regard. One is that we really need to make sure that there's priority testing available for populations in close settings. And secondly, we just have to up the reporting and monitoring of these residential care facilities to make sure that we have immediate understanding of what's going on there and that it can be addressed. Um, at the same time, we're also aware that in this circumstance, both in homes and in facilities, older persons may be locked down with family members or caregivers, and this can also increase risks of violence, abuse, and neglect, both in institutions and at home, as I said. This is something that's been highlighted very much uh, for gender-based violence. We don't have, and we should have, disaggregated data by age, but our, our concern is that those same issues that we've seen with women facing gender-based violence uh, due to lockdowns are likely being experienced by older persons as well, 
So we really want to emphasize that older persons need to be able to access support, information, and services should they be in danger um, of abuse or neglect. Um, the second uh, area that I wanted to emphasize is to really look at the broader impacts of physical distancing and what it means for older persons. Um, the physical distancing is obviously essential for the health response, so we, we aren't at all saying that it, it needs to stop, but we do need to look at the way it threatens social networks, access to health services, and day-to-day -day support, including food, medicine, and other essential care for older persons. Uh, we know that many older persons rely on home and community services and support, particularly those living alone, and we want to make sure, of course, that those services are continued. At the same time, physical distancing can have a particular toll, mental and physical, on people, and we need to be aware of that and make sure that people, especially those that are highly care dependent, are supported during this crisis. So we're really asking states to reach out and devise creative ways of reaching out to older people and delivering necessary support services, including mental and so psychosocial support. Um, and, you know, for example, one area that we've, we've seen a creative practice is using more mobile services to be able to reach people. So that's the sort of thing we're looking for there. The next area that I wanted to focus on, um, the second area, is on the broader social and economic impact of COVID-19. I won't say too much on this, um, but I think it is really important to talk about the fact that we are experiencing a historic recession and the economic impacts of this recession are going to be felt very acutely by older persons. And it's gonna widen inequalities um, that already exist both uh, within and among countries. Um, older people may also be particularly vulnerable in this economic recession. Uh, when we look at data from, from prior downturns, uh, older persons, uh, the effect on their jobs, on their social protection, can be deeper and more profound than on the generalized population. So the Secretary General himself has really highlighted that we need to look at these social and economic impacts in a, in a uh, framework that was launched actually on Monday of this week, and that we really need to look at the structural causes that have left older persons behind overall. Um, why are uh, older persons not uh, able to access the level of universal health care that's necessary, for example. So we really need to improve overall the levels of pensions, social protection, universal health care across the board so that we're much more resilient should another pandemic uh, come along or, or we continue to face this one as we go forward. The third area is really for us to talk about how we need to tackle age discrimination and address uh, digital and legal and protection gaps in this crisis. So these are three issues that I think are sort of at the core of what we've seen in terms of the human rights impact of COVID-19. And, and I wanted to make sure to, to really emphasize them today. The first is age discrimination. Of course, age discrimination is something that many of you both face personally, as, as, as uh, many do globally, but also work on um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you know the, the levels of entrenched ageism and discrimination that exists in our societies already. The reality is, of course, though, that we're seeing that COVID-19 is actually escalating some of that discrimination and ageism. So we've seen derogatory remarks and hate speech on social media um, and, and real you know, areas of concern about the way of intergenerational dialogue around these issues with um, social media having uh, comments about boomers and things that were you know, very, very um, hurtful and, and stigmatizing in many ways. And uh, the, the positive part of me wants to say that perhaps this crisis can open up a deeper dialogue and discussion around those issues and will profile them in a way that will give them greater attention. But we really do need this to be a moment where states and the media step up and recognize the diversity of older persons and stop presenting a distorted uh, picture of who older people are and how they contribute um, and what their needs are. And so this is a moment where we really need to root out some of the existing ageism and address it as directly as possible. 
The second piece that the, that the crisis has really highlighted is around digital inclusion. This is an issue um, those that work with me know that I, I do a lot of work in the area of human rights and new technologies. And of course, it's true that half the globe is not connected uh, digitally to the internet, but that is unfortunately a statistic that is, is much deeper for older persons. And so the crisis has spotlighted and magnified it's not just that it's shown that to happen, but it's also made it all the more important that older persons are not connected in as much digitally because so much is being done online that used to be done in reality. So that virtual world uh, is, is for unfortunately for too many older persons closed off. And we need to do two things simultaneously. One is we need to adopt urgent efforts to close that gap. It's not you know, impossible. There is so much that can be done. And most of the work that has been done has shown that there are really tangible ways to make sure that we give more people more access to the internet and give them the tools to use it. So we need to do that. But secondly, of course, we can't wait for that to catch up. We need to make sure that we're not, that we're recognizing that that virtual world may not be as accessible to older persons and ensure that information, and participation are not limited uh, when people don't have access to the internet. And that means working with communities, it means using radio and text and all the means available to us and doing things in accessible formats as well. The third area I wanted to emphasize is what this crisis has shown about the gaps in national and international legal protection for older persons. We know that many countries lack adequate legislation at the national level uh, to protect the rights of older persons and to address the types of discrimination and exclusion, violence and abuse that I've, that I've mentioned. We also know that the absence of an internationally agreed legal framework contributes to the vulnerability of older persons and may have contributed to some of the inadequate responses to the COVID-19 crisis. So these are gaps that we in our office, the UN Human Rights Office, very much believe need to be filled and that they have to be filled if we really will be able to ensure the rights of the growing population of older persons in all societies. You will see when you get a chance to click on those links and look at the, oh, I shouldn't say that because I just said not everybody is clicking, but you're all on the town hall, so you are clicking on links. Um, we will be able to access um, that, that document and we'll distribute it accessibly, as I said. But within the, the Secretary General's report, there is a specific recommendation that I'd like to read on this point because I think it is critical. The Secretary General calls for us to build stronger legal frameworks at both the national and international levels to protect the human rights of older persons, including by accelerating the efforts of the General Assembly's working group to develop proposals for an international legal instrument to promote and protect the rights and dignity of older persons. So that acceleration of that process is something that our office is strongly behind and will really be pushing for going forward. As I said, we see this as an opportunity for a more inclusive, more equitable, age-friendly society that will be anchored in human rights and in the principles and the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals, which emphasize leaving no one behind. I wanted to emphasize in my final point is that older persons need to be at the center of how we address these issues, of both our efforts for the response and for the recovery on, of the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to ensure that the voices, perspectives, and expertise of older persons in identifying problems and solutions are incorporated into the policy making that we're doing. This is important and I want to emphasize not just because older persons have a right, of course, that is incredibly important and I do human rights for a living as, as Jane has emphasized, so you know I believe it. But secondly, the response will not be effective unless the people's voices who are most effective are heard and incorporated. So it's also about having a sustainable and effective response. So older persons need to be engaged and that's why I so value this opportunity. I really welcome the suggestions and hearing more from you about your experiences about what it's been like to work on these issues um, more generally and during this pandemic. And I really hope there'll be more opportunities for us to work in partnership and bridge these gaps and to hear these voices going forward. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Peggy. You know, what you've really 
um, given in those 15 minutes is some solid areas that the Secretary General, you know, believes are important highlights to actually focus on, you know, access to care, physical distancing, the social and economic impact, you know, COVID as escalating ageism, and of course, the gaps of legal protection. While everybody is getting their head around what questions to ask Peggy, um, just I'd like to hand the floor over to Amal Rafay for a few minutes. Amal. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, listening to the Secretary General's message, um, I could tell that he spoke from the heart. I know that for sure because last year at the International Day of Older Persons, we invited him to deliver a video message for the day. And when we drafted that message for him, I specifically added as an older person myself. But when the message came back, the video message, that part was not there. Uh, whereas today he talks about being an older person himself. He makes reference to his mother. Um, clearly, I can safely say that the Secretary General has joined the fold. Um, and having said that, it does break my heart to say that it has to take a pandemic to bring, you know, the, um, the UN system at the senior level to prioritize older persons. But I'm very happy that that happened. And that was, um, that's a big win for us. And I, I have to really take this opportunity to, you know, commend my colleagues at OHCHR, specifically Peggy and Rio, um, you know, we refer to them as pen holders in this exercise because, you know, different agencies in the UN system pulled in to help out, but it was no easy undertaking. And certainly they played a key role in making sure that this message at, such, at the highest level at the UN is a human rights based message. Um, and I think that's um, amazing. And to us, Looking at it, I'd love to say that we're so happy to see this final product out, but at the same time, all I can see is this is just the beginning of much more work to come built on that message of the Secretary General. And just one final thing, if I may, the message sounds familiar to all of us working on older persons and protecting and promoting their rights. And that's because us, at least at the working level at the UN, in DESA and in OHCHR, work very closely with national human rights institutions and with civil society. So you, um, you know, really deserve to give yourself at least a pat on the shoulder because this came to be because of the messages that you've shared with us because you've enriched our work throughout the years and specifically the past few weeks by bringing the voices, needs and concerns and wants of older persons. And we're very grateful to all of you for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Amal. So we're going into questions now. We've got about 20 or 25 minutes. And to the extent possible, I'm going to ask you to ask the question. Um, so could you keep your questions very, very tight so that we can get through lots? Um, so I'll just give you the rundown. Um, Ken, Bluestone, um, Sylvia, and then Dr. Dung from Vietnam. So if you can keep your question really tight so that um, we can get through as many as possible. And perhaps say the question and then perhaps Sylvia can say hers and then perhaps it, there'll be a collective. So over to you, Ken. Thanks so much, Jane. And um, thank you, Peggy and um, Amal, Rio, Denise, um, Khaled, everyone in the UN system for the brilliant work that you've done. Um, my question is that given the powerful statement that the Secretary General has given and, and that this comes from the collective UN system around the need to take into account the rights of all the persons in, in the context of COVID-19, and this is so necessary and welcome. Can we see and is it possible, do you think that we can take that next step forward to articulating, actually pushing the UN system to articulate much more clearly how these rights can be protected through a new international human rights instrument, particularly in terms of ensuring the accountability of um, rights, both within the UN system and member states, but also for helping to give voice to older people who so often get left out of these discussions. 
Thanks, Ken. And I'll ask Sylvia to ask the question because there's a relationship. So, Sylvia? Yes, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Peggy, Amal, and all for this uh, excellent town hall. Um, just to follow up, and I will reiterate the question that I asked the High Commissioner in the virtual conversation a couple of weeks ago. In order to move forward the issue of um, the rights of older persons and change the paradigms, we need to increase the capacity building and the training at the regional and, and national levels. So my question to Peggy is how can the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights increase, include older persons and the issue of the rights of older persons in the training and capacity buildings at regional and country level? Thank you. Thank you. So I'll hand it over to you, Peggy. Thank you so much. Two, two very important questions and happy to have a chance to address them. Uh, Ken, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that these issues around the, the legal framework were, were very much discussed uh, around this report and, and we're very um, glad to see the opportunity that the report provides, I think, to give us um, a, a platform to, to really talk with states and do our best to move these issues forward. Of, of course, it is ultimately uh, needs to be a state-driven process, so the UN is, is uh, able to, to give voice to the concerns, to the issues, to the need uh, for an international legal instrument, but we need that to, to be taken up um, by, by states as well. Um, we're high, uh, updating our study from 2012 that highlighted the need, and we hope that will also give more impetus to this effort. Um, so we will be looking for ways to resume and accelerate the discussion as has been um, said in the, in the Secretary General's report, uh, recognizing, of course, that all of these types of processes are, um, you know, it's, there are big questions about how you do some of this virtually um, and whether or not in-person uh, meetings and, and things will be possible. So um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to, you know, really work through those issues and not, and, and be able to pick up that call for acceleration. At the same time, I really want to emphasize how much work there is to do alongside that effort as well. So one of the things that Rio has highlighted for me is the, the fact that out of 13,000 recommendations within the universal periodic review that is done of, of all the countries of the world, only 1% of them uh, relate to or brought in the needs and, and rights of older persons. So we can work multiple on multiple levels um, in addressing these legal and um, national uh, protection gaps. So I'd like to see us do that. Um, Sylvia, I really appreciate your question. And, and I think we do have a, a strong commitment uh, to doing more on these issues. Uh, as you know, though, um, uh, we are challenged in a, in a variety of ways um, in terms of how we work at the national uh, level. Uh, I think it's important to say that we have actual offices in a very few uh, uh, countries. Uh, we have one person human rights advisors in, a, in about 30 and, and actual offices in, in another, I don't know if it's 30 or so too, and then presences in peacekeeping missions. So we're only in about 80 countries and in many of those places we're quite small. Um, I don't say that as an out for us, but I say that as, as to relate to my next point, which is that we don't see this as what we can do. We see this as what the UN needs to do. And that means that our greatest value is working with UN country teams, which are present in every country and which often have, you know, many more staff and many more and much more resources than we do. So I think our greatest role is highlighting these needs and then working with resident coordinators who head up the discussions in, on a national basis about why it's important to address these needs. And then of course, providing advice and support when they put in place programs that will build capacity and training and identify these needs. Now, of course, if, if the situation were to change and we were to get all sorts of resources that would allow us to do this from, from a source that's interested in it, we would be able to more expand our, our direct engagement around these issues. But I wanna be you know, upfront with you about what some of the limitations are that we face in terms of being able to bring some of this forward. One of the encouraging things I've seen though is the work that's really happening now at the regional level within the UN system through the regional coordination offices that are very engaged on the social economic side in particular. 
And we're doing much more on that front now than we were even a year ago and certainly two years ago. So we have a team of experts that's helping us to build out okay. for our field offices on issues of, of economic and social rights. And I think when we do that work, you will see a much more enhanced engagement on issues of older persons as well. Because when we look at the data, the limited data there is, I keep emphasizing we want there to be more data, but when we look at the data we have, we know that these issues of social protection and healthcare are, are particularly uh, egregious for uh, older persons. And so I think the more we do on the economic social rights side, the more it will push us to do more that's specifically focusing on older persons as well. Sorry for the long answers, thank you. No, they're, they're not long answers, they're really important answers, so thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. Dung from Vietnam and then uh, Mark Venning um, to uh, come forward. So Dr. Dung, are you with us? I have two questions. So first, first question, uh, yeah, so what's the content from uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, should be included uh, in uh, this old people right convention in future? Uh, because uh, the, uh, in my country, you take part, uh, took part in, in the prepare the, for the, this uh, convention, uh, how to, to put uh, uh, some uh, content uh, for, uh, based on the uh, less learned uh, pandemic, this pandemic uh, in future in uh, this, this conference. Okay, uh, well, let's, let's take that first question and perhaps if I can say it again. You know, yeah. you, you've asked what content from COVID-19 yeah. pandemic should be yeah. included in the Older Pe People's Rights Convention in the future. So let's, let's hold that one there and we'll go to Mark Venning, which is yeah. different. Um, Mark, are you with us? Yeah. Thank uh, you. Over to you. Yeah, I had sent you a question and now you're bringing up and the... Uh, group here. So what can we do to counteract the negative attitudes towards uh, international groups such as the WHO that the media keeps spewing? Uh, <clears throat> it's not that everybody's talking that way, but it's a, it's a bothersome thing. If, if we're trying to, trying to do an international perspective on things, what can we do to counteract that? Thanks. No, I, I think it probably resonates with, with, with many. Um, look, the, the issues around misinformation, disinformation, negative speech, I think, Again, it, it, especially everybody's looking at the internet so much now as well, even more than usual. You know, I think it's been it's been really problematic. And um, what our office has emphasized in this is, you know, the best way to address those problems is not, you know, broad based, you know, takedowns or content moderation that will eliminate that. It's it's really making sure to promote and engage with the speech that, that answers it and, and provides evidence-based, accurate, credible information to address those issues. So, you know, it's, it is the case that sometimes the negative messaging trans, you know, uh, is, goes viral much more easily than, than other things. And we need to be the ones that are, are counterbalancing that by spreading the, the messages that, that really should be out there and, and will be more constructive and productive. I know that's not a panacea by any means, but, um, but that's, that's basically the approach that, that, that we're taking. Um, Dr. Dung, I wanted to, to also take up your important question about how we're learning from this pandemic and, and how that will inform the work around um, an international legal instrument. You know, I do think it's a really important point that through the experience and, and reporting on the experiences of what are happening here, we see really, you know, case studies in all the issues that we think need to be addressed in an international uh, legal instrument. So issues such as equality and non-discrimination, autonomy and independence of older people, uh, rights to long-term care, social protection, you know, I think all of those issues would come through. Um, and I think what's helpful is that, I mean, it's hard to say anything's helpful when it's such a horrible experience that, that people are living through. But it will, as I said, focus attention in on what it means when we don't have protection in some of these areas, or there's, there are differing standards that haven't been discussed between places um, that could be bolstered, enhanced, um, made stronger 
through discussions around an international legal instrument. So I do think um, it gives, you know, in that respect, an opportunity to really move forward. And, and thank you. And Dr. Dung, you know, in our preparation with Peggy and Rio and Amal, you know, we said that this is also about receiving information, but giving information, you know, to the UN. And, and so, you know, we have a really important role to play in this. The next three people that I'll call on, um, Claudia Muller from Germany, Margaret Gillis from Canada, and Joseph Batat from Philippines. I just want to put a, a hello out to those people in New Zealand. It's very late there. So thank you for being on the call. So Claudia. Yes, thank you. I hope you hear me good. Uh, I'm Claudia Mahler from Germany. And I think it's a wonderful day to be here with you today. I just took up uh, today um, my mandate as the, as the next independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights of all the persons. So thank you also to the UN for releasing this wonderful paper today. And I would like to ask also with my other head as NHRI to Becky, um, how can we support the open-ended working group to happen as soon as possible and make it more a priority in the UN system? Because I think it's key now that we start again with, our, with the consultations and also to get the considerated outcome paper. Thank you. Um, before we go on to Margaret, I think we just um, do a big round of applause for your appointment. So welcome. You're never going to get that, are you? Never. Um, okay, so Margaret Gillis from Canada. All right, 79% of the deaths that have happened uh, as a result of COVID-19 in Canada have happened in long-term care, so it's really a national disgrace. Um, Canada already has strong protections for uh, the rights of older people, and that's clearly not working in this situation, so I think the need for a convention is very clear. We've been working with other NGOs in the country, IFA and CanAge, um, to move the Canadian government to support the convention. Um, and we've been working obviously very hard at the open-ended working group. Can we use other UN organizations to push the Canadian government uh, is my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Margaret. And Joseph Batak from the Philippines. Joseph? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, uh, just as a quick question, uh, this COVID-19 fatality in the Philippines, 70% uh, of them are uh, older adults. How can this be mitigated? Uh, uh, that's the, uh, here, the practice is predominantly aging in place, so we don't have much of these uh, home care facilities. So we're, I'm working on it uh, in terms of advocacy to the local government, but I was wondering how can I reach out to the UN system regarding this? Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Well, you're being very kept, kept very busy today, Peggy, so over to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I'm so glad that Claudia is on the call. Uh, I hadn't realized you were there, and congratulations. Uh, the, the job that, uh, that she is picking up, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, but is an incredibly important one. We'll, we'll miss her predecessor, who has done a, an amazing job, and uh, uh, Ken, I think, mentioned Halid. Uh, Hassan, who's been working with us on this briefing paper and has been a huge resource and will continue to support that um, mandate of the independent expert. Um, but we're so glad that, that Claudia has, has taken up the mantle. And yes, we've given her this birthday present of an older person's report for her first day in office. So, uh, so that's, that's nice to see. Um, I, I think in terms of you know, what can happen on the open-ended working group and what does acceleration mean, you know, I'm sure others on the call probably will have uh, viewpoints on this. And from my perspective, I think, of course, the report itself gives us an impetus to have a cross UN conversation about this, okay? Um, and that itself, you know, will, will help us to bring people together to discuss what would it look like to accelerate this process and, um, and to really, you know, come up with, brainstorm with and come up with ideas. And that obviously relates very much to Margaret's question as well, that you know, it will be states wanting that to happen as well, and which states can we, can we encourage uh, through this? I mean, again, I, I always feel uncomfortable saying this, but I do think that the experience of this pandemic is in a, you know, a really, in this respect, an opportunity because it is highlighting um, in so many ways the, the 
legal challenges that older persons face. And as, as Margaret, you know, said, when you have statistics like the, what she referenced in terms of deaths of older persons in residential care facilities, you know, it's clear that much more needs to be done. So, so I do think we have an opportunity. Um, I think we need to think more about what it will, what it will look like to move it forward, especially given the limitations um, of, of working in this virtual space. But I, you know, I do think it's going to be important. Um, and I think that that really answers then both Claudia and, and Margaret's uh, points on the on the residential care facilities. You know, I, I would just want to emphasize again um, how important we is uh, we think it is that there be um, uh, testing and monitoring. And you know, we need to also look at the fact that of course many of these facilities have been closed down to outside visitors and the impact that that might have in terms of how these things are happening as well. Um, so, you know, really balancing those issues of needing to have physical distancing, but that when we isolate facilities through that type of measure, it may actually contribute to some of these outcomes. Um, thank you so much for your question from the Philippines. Um, I think, you know, in terms of, of the outcomes and how they're being uh, felt in the Philippines, you know, the, the key there for us is, is, is identifying and accessing older people at risk as quickly as possible. And I don't know enough about the situation for you um, to know, you know, what specific measures might be taken. But I do wonder if my colleague from DESA, Amal, might have uh, more to say in terms of how the UN system might be able to engage on some of those points. She had referenced for me the global response plan. Um, and efforts that are being made to make sure that it brings in older persons earlier. So maybe Amal, it's a good moment for you to say more on that. Yeah, thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, uh, to start backwards, um, Joseph, I'd highly encourage you to go to WHO's uh, guidance notes. Our colleagues at WHO posted online, uh, they were one of the first to do this, a comprehensive guidance notes for long-term care facilities prevent COVID-19 and the spread. It's a, it's a powerful resource to have. Um, yeah, and for the, um, uh, the reference that Peggy made to the, um, to the Secretary General's COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Fund, we know it was issued, I think, uh, around a month ago, but, uh, and we're anticipating, my understanding is that it's updated once a month. And uh, the first draft that was issued did bring up older persons, but did not identify them as a priority group. And with, um, I mean, credit on this, so the upcoming one where we're anticipating that there will be more in-depth analysis and reference, perhaps even, and I don't want to jinx it, uh, reference to older persons as a priority group in that draft, that is 100% due to uh, the efforts and advocacy of civil society uh, with the UN and with the OTA on that work. So we're, we're grateful to them and we encourage them to continue, uh, you know, bringing the voices of older persons to the UN. With the question that Claudia had asked regarding the open-ended working group, um, Peggy said it really very clearly. I mean, as UN agencies, we work together we work collaboratively. I'm very comfortable that our messaging is aligned, which is really big and major. But whether or not the session takes place um, this year is really uh, depends on uh, member states deciding to do so. And also, what's the situation in New York in terms of accessing the headquarters? Um, from what I've heard, is that even the high level um, and some discussions on the General Assembly itself that they're looking into virtual options uh, to doing them. So, and with a lot of other events that have been canceled and postponed and sort of a backlog towards the uh, fourth quarter of this year, I'm not so sure how things will turn out. I, I'm more um, Leaning, to more, leaning towards this taking place in April next year, but we don't know. And uh, as soon as we find out some more, I'll, I'll be more than happy to share with colleagues so that you're, you know, you're better informed and prepared. And it would be updated on the official website of the Open End Report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Amal. Um, I will ask um, uh, two other people to come forward with questions. Uh, Lucy, 
bit of Vicova. Thank you. And also um, Vijay from uh, India. So, yep. Lucy, are you on the line? Yes, hello. Good, good uh, to see everybody. Uh, my question is, as we are uh, really trying to go forward with, uh, as I was sharing, for example, this Galway uh, appeal and just really to stop ageism and age discrimination in COVID-19 uh, responses. Uh, and I've been approached by, you know, several journalists asking me, so how, um, how should we call this group, if not, uh, you know, seniors and older people, as being at risk. Um, so this is the, the thin line between being ageist and, and the age forward and, and, call, um, and uh, connecting it with the risk um, and uh, yet still deliver the important messages we are uh, talking here about. Thank you. Okay. Um, and we'll just take another question from Vijay Narudu um, about disaggregated statistics. Are you on the line, Vijay? Perhaps if I can just um, share the question. Um, are disaggregated statistics available which show ethnic minorities make the large number of COVID victims? Um, back to me then. Hi, um, no, I, I, look, I, I actually found Lucy's question very interesting because it's one that we sometimes, I, it's, I always say too much in these things, but we debate this with our, our press people sometimes when we're speaking on these issues. That, they want a different language uh, to be used than what we think is, is appropriate. Um, so that, you know, we confront this issue of there sometimes being a gap between um, how people think it would be effective to talk about uh, these issues to reach the broader audience and speech that isn't ageist and is respectful. Um, my sense is that, you know, we can find a way to, do, to, to bridge that and to, to talk in a way that recognizes differences based on age, but that isn't ageist. Um, and I do think it actually links into this question about data to some extent, that if we're talking about it from an evidence-based perspective, you know, I, I used the statistic that one in five uh, older persons have an underlying health condition that makes them more at risk from COVID-19. That's you know, that is speaking about it from a fact-based perspective. It's not saying all older persons are vulnerable or needy. It's simply saying this is evidence that shows a particular um, area of need that ought to be addressed when we're looking at the COVID-19 response. And I think that's that sort of evidence-based approach to how we deal with it is going to be helpful. I also do think having more data, um, again, I know I've, I've seen that refrain already today, but uh, um, I do think that that will help as well. But I'd be really interested in other people's perspectives on this issue too, because I think it is a, is a difficult one and I'm glad you flagged it, Lucy. Um, in terms of the data on deaths, um, particularly for ethnic minorities, um, you know, I haven't seen that data yet. Um, I do know that one of the things that our office has really emphasized is that we really have pushed that national response plans need to be inclusive and that the same people that tend to be excluded and left behind um, in many cases will will find themselves left behind in the COVID-19 response and so you know the the existing inequalities are then exacerbated so to the extent that ethnic minorities are often uh, groups that that face endemic discrimination you know to me it would not be surprising if we saw that the the levels of support and treatment um, in those communities uh, would perhaps be lower. But I also, you know, recognize that this is a pandemic that has had a very, you know, disparate impact to some extent um, in terms of hitting some communities very hard. Um, I heard a story this morning about the South African pandemic that focused on the fact that um, part of the reason South Africa feels it can open up now is that the pandemic tended to hit, hit higher income areas more than um, areas with, with uh, enclosed populations, um, in part because of uh, ability to travel and other things. I, I'm not citing that as a fact at all. I, I, this is me listening to the news. Um, but I do think that we have to be very careful about making judgments about which groups have been affected in which ways. We need the data to really be able to assess that. But I think the underlying concern that ethnic minorities um, and other groups that are often excluded 
in various ways, we really need to identify that and make sure that they're being planned for as part of national responses. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Peggy. And I'm um, just sort of giving you the time to think of those takeaway questions that you're going to give everybody on the line today. And in doing that, you have one last question that I think is important and speaks to the very issues around the rights of older people are human rights. So Bridget Sleep, would you just like to um, come forward and ask Peggy that question? And then Peggy, you can go into your closing remarks. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, yes, so we too very much welcome this brief and certainly see that the Secretary General's leadership is very encouraging in this area. Um, not only in terms of sort of the longer term sort of responses that we want to see, but also in the immediate impact on changing the response now during the pandemic. And part of this um, is going to be critical that states themselves get behind the Secretary General and respond to his calls for them to step up their efforts. So the question to you, Peggy, is what do you think can be done to make that happen? How can we get states to come behind the Secretary General and respond to the recommendations in the report? Thank you. Thanks. That's that's a that's a great question, as Jane said, for to, to sort of incorporate into the, the final things I wanted to say. Um, I just in terms of the mechanics of how that works. To me, uh, we've seen in, in these uh, intergovernmental processes that what you need is leadership. You need a core group of states, preferably across regions, so that it's not seen as an initiative from you know one group or another that really cares about this issue and is going to promote it. So the, the, the reality is it's really building that group of states, and it can be fairly small, but cross-regional, that will make this a priority going forward. And as I said, it is my hope that potentially the concerns around the COVID pandemic will you know, ratchet this up in terms of the level of priority that some states are willing to give. So it's, it is a moment where we should push against that door uh, with states that have always been interested, but perhaps maybe haven't followed it through um, as much as we might like to see. We know they care. This is a moment to really say, well, let's put that into practice. We have a, a really important need here that needs to be met. Um, so that's one big takeaway, I think. Um, the second is about this issue of how we make sure that older persons are included. And I would say that in two different ways. One is really and of course this group is, is indicative of it, you know, making sure that we are spreading the world word that we are as vocal as possible as we can be on these issues, that we transmit these messages and these reports to as wide an audience as possible, and that we push back against those who, who don't speak about these issues or bring them into their response effectively. So that broad level of advocacy and activism around these issues has never been more important. But I would also say it's also about really looking at the, the uh, community level as well. How can we together make sure that these really serious concerns that have been raised over failure to include older persons in the response in the way that they need to be are addressed. So really highlighting, monitoring, exposing um, gaps where they exist, uh, including as, as we've talked about in residential care facilities and bringing that forward. So it's both the general advocacy on the broader issues as we've talked about, but the specific advocacy about how this pandemic is affecting older persons, where there are gaps in support services, where there is need for um, shelter from um, neglect and violence and abuse. You know, the more those issues are talked about, the more we'll be able to get more of a response on them, I think. And then finally, um, I, would, I would just say that it is a moment where um, we are looking from our office about what this, what this pandemic means, not just in the Western developed world, but what it means globally, and about the overwhelming need for us to stand in solidarity and to support the, the attention and need that will, will need to be given for healthcare systems and governments and, and across the globe to really engage on these issues. Um, if that doesn't happen, it, older persons, as we've discussed, will suffer and will suffer more and disproportionately than, than the broader population. So our first line of defense has to be to make sure that the right to health is respected. And that means having the levels of treatment, 
and uh, response necessary, not just uh, in the developed world, but across the globe as, as the pandemic uh, grows in, in other places and, and uh, goes through these various waves that unfortunately we're likely to see across the globe. So we're really counting on everybody to raise their voice in the support of that more global response as well. Thank you. Okay, and, and thank you very much, Peggy, and to all those on the call today. In closing, the IFA welcomes you know, the opportunity to share these forums with you. I want to acknowledge the IFA team who are always on these calls, but most particularly Andra and Chesley, who work incredibly hard to help make this happen. And my final comment really goes to the fact that our greatest strength against COVID is our unity and our collective leadership. Now is not the time for territories. Now is the time to join together in solidarity and create the solidarity that becomes the norm not the unusual. So thank you very much for being part of this. We welcome um, you all next Friday to uh, COVID and older people, an age-friendly perspective. So this is where the good practices and the, le the, the lessons learned you know, are coming forward to share. So thank you once again, Peggy, Amal and Rio and everybody on the call. Have a good day or night or sleep. <laughs>